So in this video, what I'm gonna be doing is asking you one of the best questions that I ask to my most wealthy clients. These are people who you often see on television, and this is a question that I find just tickles them because they can see how valuable it is for them to have an amazing life. And here's what it is. Imagine that you had to produce the money and results and success that you planned to. You had to do it, okay? And if you didn't do it, okay, so you had to do it. But at the same time, you also had to be happy the entire time. You could never get upset. You could never kind of dive into stress as this sort of self-motivating strategy. Could that happen? And what I'm gonna talk about in this video is exactly how to do it. Now, here's why I say this. In my own life, I built a business, and the business has gone to eight figures a year, and that's been a great, great joy of mine to contribute a lot. But at the same time, what I found you know, by age 42 was a lot of the time, I'm just frustrated and angry because I'm dealing with a lot of staff members, I'm dealing with a lot of people, I've got, I've got a million different plates spinning, and I've gotta produce results, and there's so many little things that are blowing up all the time, and it's so exasperating, and what I find is, if I don't address that and maybe even get a little bit upset about it, it just keeps happening again and again. And often it's when I get frustrated or upset that you know I go and I change things. So getting upset, it winds up being the sort of catalyst for me to not let the same problem keep happening again and again. But what I realize that as your business grows and it gets more and more complex, or your success grows, could be in relationships, could be out socializing, meeting people, could be in health, it's whatever, it, whatever it is. But as you move up the totem pole towards amazing world-class results, what you'll find is there's simply too much going on, and as a result, you're just frustrated all the time. You're constantly frustrated. So this is very, very important for you if you're wealthy, but what if right now you're not even wealthy? What if right now you're broke, or what if right now you're not successful? What if right now you're not doing well socially, you don't have a lot of relationships, or plate spinning. What if you don't have a lot going on right now? How is this video important to you? This video is equally important to you because you've got to start to realize, wait a minute, even when I get this success in, what, in whatever area that is, is that I think that I want, health, wealth, relationship, higher purpose, or whatever, whenever I get that success, I have to be even more frustrated. So what is it that you're really working towards? You're basically like this hamster on a hamster wheel, a battery in the system that's probably making a lot of people that are very elite, very, very rich, but at the same time, what are you even doing for you? And by the way, when I say people that are elite, very, very rich, I'm talking like, even if you've got a business doing a couple billion a year in revenue, there's people even beyond that, and so you're sitting there frustrated, and people with generational wealth, they're just sitting there enjoying it, flying around in their private jet, doing nothing while you're in there hustling and grinding. So no matter what the case, no matter where you are in life, you're gonna be sitting there frustrated for some people that are just kind of benefiting off you like a battery. You don't want that to be your life. I know that, and so that's why you've gotta get this down. What I'm gonna explain in this video is what it would mean to move beyond just using frustration as a coaching tactic and what it would mean to have total self-control. And what you're gonna realize over time is it's not just about being an executor, but a transcendent executor, and that your results can be a thousand times more powerful, but just like how you built systems in your business, you've gotta build systems internally in your psyche and in your inner game. So that topic is what we're gonna be going into right now. And by the way, as you're doing this, the single most important thing that I think that you could do to help internalize this now while it's on your mind is to click the link below because we also do free calls from all over the world. The free call is something that I built with a lot of very, very powerful questions. Just like this question that I told you here that's meant to shock you a little bit and take you through a process, the free call is a call that takes you through a process and it's an extensive process that really drills down on what it is that's causing you to fail in your health, wealth, relationship, and higher purpose, but also what it is that you personally maybe need to hear to succeed. And this is something that I built a system to help you in person and see the challenges when you watch this video. If you don't do the free call, what winds up happening? It winds up just being this other thing that you watch. But if right now you could just feel yourself wanting to do the free call and clicking the link below, and getting on the call and being a little bit adventurous, saying, you know what, I'm not just gonna sit here surfing because I'm about results. If you're about results, click the link below and jump on the free call. And what I think you're going to experience on this free call is a paradigm shift that you're gonna be really, really excited about. And then this video is gonna make a thousand times more sense. So click this link below and get on the free call. Set it up, you're gonna really, really enjoy it. I'm very, very excited for you to get on that free call and watch this video right now, which we will jump into. Let's go. I'm gonna give you a thought experiment right now. What if I told you that you had to do two things and you'd get shot in the head if you didn't do it? Number one is you had to get everything done. Everything, everything that you plan to get done, you had to get it done. Or you'd get shot in the head. Could you do it? Yeah. yeah. Now, what if I told you a different thing that you had to do? You just had to stay in a good mood no matter what. Okay, you could relax, you don't have to do too much, but you had to stay in a good mood. Could you do it? No. Yeah. Yeah. Just relax, yeah. no responsibility. So, so one would be optimizing for results, and the other would be optimizing for happiness. So if you had to optimize for happiness, could you do it? Maybe. Could you, change your, could you move your life around, change your perspective, reframe things, 
Use your focus, your physiology, your belief system, what you do day to day, rearrange your life in a way that could be easy. What if you, you know, what if you had enough money, you didn't have to worry about money, so your needs were taken care of. You know, you had a significant other, so your needs are taken care of. Could you optimize for happiness knowing that if you are unhappy, even for more than 10 minutes, you get shot in the head? Could you do it? Yeah. Knowing that you'd be shot in the head. Yeah. No. Knowing you'd be shot in the head if you get in a bad mood. Could you say to yourself, it's not worth it? No. Yeah. It's not worth it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You actually probably could because you'd know right now, you're like, it's not worth it. No, I want, to be, I want to be around here another 10 minutes. The first time that I had this awakening, I was in uh, Hawaii, and my air mattress broke when I was camping, and I had to sleep on these rocks. And I remember just being like, this just sucks. This is so not what my vision of my vacation looks like, like me sleeping Tell on this. Tell them how it happened to it. Like, it's like, pew. You remember the story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember the story, or do you yeah. just know it from experience? I, I, know, I, I know it from your story. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's like, you, like I remember I was... Uh, I was sleeping, I think, and I could feel like just like a slight, like, like kind of like being slightly poked, slightly more poked, slightly more poked. Why is that fun? Just kind of slightly more poked, slightly more poked. And then, you know, and so, you know, so then like, I could, and then I'm just like, I'm sinking. And then I learned, and then I learned to use a Cartman voice to yes. reframe it. And I was like, this sucks. I hate this. I wish I was dead. This is the worst. So that's called a reframing, right? You can use a Cartman voice to make something funny, okay? So basically going from that same standpoint, I, I felt that happen. And I taught myself that week and I realized, I'm like, you know, Winston Churchill says history is one darn thing after another. That is his definition of history, right? So you gotta understand, it's never gonna end. Like, that is my realization. It's never going to end. People are going to continue to let you down. You will let yourself down. Things will happen. Things out of your control will happen. Weird, freaky stuff will happen. You want to hear a crazy story? Okay, laugh at this one. Okay, laugh at this one. I had to remove all my groups, all, all the groups that were making us a lot of revenue. All my different groups, I took them down. Okay, all these amazing groups that we had. I had, to, I had no choice. I had to take them down. I had to take down 10 years of videos. That was my life's work for 10 years. I had to take all that down. I had to take down digital products. I take down all my digital products, all my websites, my giant hub that I spent $300,000, $400,000 building. All this stuff, I take it all down. All my programs, we, you know, we don't continue working with different uh, business relations that we have. Take it all apart for two years. I do all this, right? Now, while this is happening, I'm rebuilding another company, basically the new company, trying to make it look like I didn't just do that thing to my other company, right? I want to make it look seamless, okay? I worked every day, every single day, from when I woke up to when I went to sleep for two years. I had a lot of cortisol. I gained some weight. I had to learn how to control my energy and master my energy. I thought there was no way out of this. I'm like, there's no, I'm like, we are done. We will never get out of this. Because I always had a dream that we would have a big, beautiful movement with professionally shot videos, beautiful seminars, like, like seminar quality, product quality seminars released for free online for everybody. Um, video shot all over the world, all sorts of real life interactive footage. Like I had a vision to have the budget for that and a team of people. I didn't want to just be me shooting into a handy camera, into a phone, even though I think that's great and I'd love to teach you how to do it. I just wanted to do it like that, even though I think what I described is an amazing starting point to get you going. But I had that vision. I didn't want to let it go and retreat, right? Because once you retreat too much, it's hard to make your way back. You get too comfortable. I didn't want to back down. So I worked morning till night for about two years. And Every single person around me told me I couldn't do it. You're done. It's over. You'll never bounce back from this. It's never going to happen. And I found new way after new way after new way. I learned more about business than I ever thought I would in my life. That's how hard I worked. I would have to find new paradigms of revenue, of monetization, of sales, of marketing, of product creation, energy management. I went so crazy. It was to the point that I was actually struggling with kind of wishing I was dead a little bit, even though I didn't really wish I was dead. But I would catch myself at traffic lights kind of walking into traffic and, I, and there wasn't even enough willpower for me to care if I got hit because I was going so many months in a row. Like it was so many months in a row in go mode that it got to the point that like I'd be talking to somebody and if they weren't saying something that would help me to save the company, I'd just be, I feel like my face is on fire. I'd be like, why are they saying all this weird stuff about like fun stuff? <laughs> go away from me, you fun thing, right? And, and I had to stay in that mode for a number of years. And it was really the hardest thing I did in my life. And I rebuilt the thing. I rebuild and rebuild and rebuild and rebuild and rebuild. And I'm sitting out there in Miami Summit about, it was about two years ago, maybe a little less. And I'm sitting there and we've stabilized an eight figure business. We haven't had to make layoffs and I've literally done it. And, I'm sit, and we have a cash surplus. I'm like, and I'm like, I did it. I did it. 
I did the impossible. This, I did it. I had to learn so much along the way. I did it, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm sitting on this, on this hammock at the Standard in Miami, and I, I probably like got present, like looked up, and I just look around, I'm like, how come there's not a lot of people here during model season in Miami? It's kind of weird that this place is kind of empty. Normally this place is packed. <laughs> so like I go to the front, and I've been worried about this for a while because I kind of, I, I, I know a lot of people at the top, and I was kind of worried they were going to do this. And so I go, I go, and I'm like, how come there's no one here? And they're like, oh, there's like this weird like lockdown thing, and you know, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, I run a business about social skills in a world of social distancing. I run business in bars and clubs and seminar rooms. And I'm like, I'm like and I'm just like, God, why? 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 And, and I thought to myself, I think I was like in some weird streamline of reality where I was meant to fail. And I somehow was so forceful that in my mind, I was like, I will not fail. I will not fail. And I like bent reality to the point where I just couldn't fail to where the only thing that could stop me was a global pandemic lockdown that would just stop me. And I was like, this is what I get for not just accepting fate that I was done. And I just thought that. And so I go back to LA and I sit in this banya, this like Russian banya for like four days, just like my hands in my face. Like I'm like, I just wish I would have known this two years ago. I could have done something different. Why did I do this? Right. And, you know, and a lot of key players abandoned ship at that point because they thought that I was done as well. A lot of really key players abandoned ship. And it was really interesting to see when that happened, how many people abandoned ship. And it was very eye-opening. I love it when that happens because you get to learn who's really with you and who believes in what you do. And I sat there for about four days in disbelief, like, why did I spend the last four years like this? And then on the fifth day, I just snapped out of it. I woke up. And I started breaking out Instagram Live and YouTube Live. And if you guys remember, I was doing Instagram and YouTube Live twice a day. Do you guys remember that? I was on Instagram Live and YouTube Live twice a day. And I'm going, go to ISAS communication. 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 And I made a video about being fearless, which I put a video about, um, uh, it was from uh, Apocalypto. And if you guys remember that, anybody remember that? And, and people put in the comments like, oh, you've just got it so good, Owen. You don't even, this is not hard for you. You've got it made. And I'm thinking like, I run a business in social skills and seminar rooms that I've been fighting back from, from having my, my like 18 year business that I had to rebuild in the past few years. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But see, I sat there calm and with a good attitude. And if I can sit there calm with, with a good attitude, you can too. And so literally what I did was I taught myself how to run an entire business right off of doing live broadcasts. And it was just unbelievable. And I'd gotten rid of a lot of key players that I was actually paying a lot of money to that I was making rich and they were doing with me, got rid of them. And all of a sudden our business started doing very, very well with us doing live broadcasts. And then what we did was we spent the entire lockdown building an online mentoring group, which was better than any live program that I've ever created because it lasts for several months. And so because the program is several months, I was able to put all this detail into it and I can teach it to people from South Africa, from Australia, from Asia, from anywhere in the world. And that opened up this entirely new lane for us, showed me how to run an entire business online in rapid speed. And I built the best program of my life, which is that mentoring group that you were just a part of. I had as much reason to be depressed as anybody. And I just, but it taught me how to dig deeper. That's what it taught. So that you can always dig deeper. There's always another level that you can go to. That's what I got out of it. And by the way, I'm gonna give you one other insight that I got from like get, getting beaten down so many times is this. And maybe, I don't know how my story will end. Maybe my story will end with me just being out for the count. And that can happen, right? This is in real life, it's not a movie. Bad things happen to people that try their best. Nothing is guaranteed. That's scary, but it's true. But I'll tell you this. The big thing that if I, if I could take it back Here's the one thing I would do different. There were so many times in my 20s and 30s that I'd be trying to make the perfect product, like you know, Blueprint or Foundations or the Our Best Program Ever stuff or the, uh, you know, the stuff I was putting online. And I would often be in a bad mood because what would happen was in that bad mood, I would, uh, I'd want to be perfect. Like I'd want to get it as good as I could get it. You know, I want to build legacy. I want to build something amazing. I get in a bad mood. When I had to sit there deleting all that, that was one of the worst days of my life. And the best part is, as the same people, and no offense to any of you guys if you did this, but the same people who literally didn't go to bat for me, like I can't defend myself here, but who didn't go to bat for me are complaining that I have to take it down and blaming me. <laughs> right? They're blaming me. And it's like, Y'all didn't go to bat for me, but it doesn't matter. They're like, well, why don't you tell us what to do? Because I can't. I can't say what to do. You've got to wake up. But people didn't do that. So imagine the same people you're trying to help are the ones mad at you. So it's like every little angle, like any little codependent approval seeking that I have is getting 
mess with and the legacy feelings are getting messed with and, and, and even having like people who I really trust just abandoning ship getting messed with and just seeing that it really poked a lot of buttons on me. But here's the main lesson from it. If I could do it all over again, I would have just enjoyed those 10 or 15 years I was recording that stuff. It's like, if I would have known it would have to get taken down anyway, now look, it's still around. That legacy never goes away. You can never unsee it. It will always be around. But if I'd known I was going to have to take it down, I would have just had fun. That's the difference I would have had. And I've taken that attitude funny enough into my relationships at a much higher level. Like one thing I've learned from like, you know, just different relationships in life is like, if you were to look back at all your relationships that went nowhere, if you could do it again, what's the one thing you do different? You would have just had fun. You know what I mean, right? You're like, we would have broken up anyway. We should just hooked up, gone to restaurants, gone to movies, done some travel. And that'd be it. And anyway, right? Think of all these little fights that you have. You know like what I referred to earlier as like co-enabling? You're co-enabling each other to hide from God type thought experiment. It's like, if I could just take them back, I would just have fun. I wouldn't argue. I wouldn't make drama. I wouldn't get mad at them. I wouldn't judge them. I just accept them through there, have fun. When it ends, it ends. That's what I do. So I'm actually able to do that in my relationships now. Like, you're not really going to see me getting mad. I'm just having fun. My buddies will call me and they're like, I'm mad at my girlfriend or I'm mad at my boyfriend, different friends of mine. And I'm like, just who cares? Just go have fun. Why do you care? If it ends, it ends. Who cares? You think that on some level that getting mad is going to fix it, right? That's why you get mad. You believe it's going to fix it. It's not. It's just that co-enabling thing that we're talking about. It's you hiding from your potential. Just go have fun. Well, this is what I was saying here. If I could have redone those 10 years of videos, I would just have fun. And when I'm here, I want to just have fun. And when I go out, I want to just have fun. So here's the key. Let's go back to that initial thought experiment we gave earlier then. So what we said is imagine if you had to optimize just for accomplishment. You could get as stressed as you want, you could be angry, you could freak out, you could do whatever, but you had to get it done. Gut in your head, gotta get your goals done. Doesn't mean that they're done perfectly first time. Every time that's not possible, but they're always in forward momentum. Could you do it? What would that look like? So that's the thought, I'm gonna get you to write that down. You are allowed to get super duper 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 mad, okay? As a way to put yourself in check. That's the first experiment. The second one is could you optimize for being happy? You could just cut corners, rationalize, reframe, ignore, pretend, you know, bury your head in the sand. You could do whatever. And what would that look like? Okay, now by the way, I'm gonna first have you do that. But the later thought experiment I'm gonna give you, but don't do that yet, not yet, not yet, is I'm gonna ask you, what if you had to do both? What if you had to get everything done and be in a good mood? What if you had to do both? This is a question I ask of my wealthiest one-on-one -on -one clients and they love this question. What if you had to do both? Because so many of my wealthy clients, they've accomplished so much and they become so miserable and they realize it. So what if you had to do both? But first, let's get locked in on what it would look like for you to simply get everything done even if you got mad. And what I'm gonna get you to think about is what does the getting mad do? Because it serves a function, doesn't it? It does serve a function. What does getting mad do as far as your goals? Holds you, it's, it's almost like a coach, right? It's the blue flame of fire. The blue flame of fire. It holds you accountable, you know? It's got some guardrails so you don't go too off the rails, right? Oh, I blew it, I, you know, you move forward, you go off the rails, oh, I blew it, I blew it, I blew it. You'll get back on track, right? That's that idea, okay? But that's playing the role of a coach. Maybe it's, it's even helping to limit you. You could easily solve the problem, but you get yourself all mad with this self-generated resistance, and then what winds up happening is it actually limits you. Maybe it's limiting you. Maybe it's helping you. It's usually both. Like a significant other who hooks up with you, who has fun with you, but also distracts you and demoralizes you, it's usually both. So I'm gonna get you to think about what that getting mad is doing for you. Later, we're gonna be looking at building systems. How do you build a system to where you don't need to just get mad at yourself so that you, because the thing is, is that if you don't address what that anger is doing, it's like someone that tries to quit smoking weed. People are like, you know what, I'm just gonna stop smoking weed. I'm like, no, you're not. You're gonna keep smoking weed. And they're like, no, I'm not. I'm quitting smoking weed. I'm like, no, you're having a brief moment of awareness. You're having a brief moment of clarity. You're having a brief spark of motivation. And then you're gonna keep smoking that weed. As Stephen A. Smith would say, right? The weed. So you're gonna do it, right? If someone's gonna quit smoking weed, you know what they're gonna to say to me? What does marijuana do? It allows you to access the transcendent via a plant. Instead, what you have to do is say, how can I access the transcendent on my own? 
So you've got to tell me what you're going to do to access the transcendent independently, not with the weed. So once you do that, then you can replace it in the same way. Oh, I'm not going to get mad anymore. Yeah, right. In this moment of clarity, you might see it's not doing anything for you, but guess what? That anger is doing something for you. It's playing the role of coach. So how do you replace that? Maybe accountability systems. Maybe having little alarms. Maybe writing things down. Maybe having mastermind groups. Maybe being more accountable. Maybe you're fighting all the systems and everything you do. And now you don't need to get mad. Because here's what I found. At higher levels of accomplishment, achievement, entrepreneurship, whatever, the getting mad thing doesn't work anymore. There's too many problems, right? At a, at, at, at a mid to intermediate level, getting mad helps you because it puts you on track. When you're living in a reality where things are melting down, like when, there's, when, when in an average day, there's five different episodes that most people will be thinking about and traumatized for for two years, <laughs> like five things will happen in a day that the average person two years later would be like, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. They'd be doing that for two years later, and that's happened to you five times a day. Getting mad is not going to solve the problem, is it? You could, you're just going to be so mad. And that happens to a lot of my friends who accomplish a lot, or people I coach. They're so angry. There's so many people exploiting them, screwing them over. Because when you build value, it's like you take a, a chunk of sugar and leave it on your lawn. Insects are going to come get it, a raccoon, ants, everything comes to get it. As you build value, all these problems happen, right? Like Notorious B.I.G. said, mo money, mo problems. You're going to have more problems. So you can't even enjoy that money. You won't even be able, you could make $100 million, but if you've got five, 10 episodes a day that are that bad, you can't even enjoy it. So why do it? But when you start thinking this way, maybe you can enjoy it. So first exercise, what we're going to do is we're going to say to ourselves, how would we achieve whatever it is that we say that we're going to do? How do we do it? You can get as mad as you want. Put boundaries on yourself, whatever it is. Next one, what if you were to, okay, so the first one's how to optimize for achievement. Second one is how to optimize for being in a great mood. By the way, sad truth is, what do most people optimize for? Neither. They're miserable and they accomplish nothing. <laughs> and they blame everybody else. What was your second one? Achievement is number one. Good mood is number two. What would it look like to optimize for achievement and what would it look like to optimize for good win? Later, we're gonna come back and we're gonna say, what would it look like to optimize for both? Okay, but first, achievement. Second of all, good mood. If you had a gun at your head, gun at your head, okay? Up. Get writing, talk to people in groups, talk to each other, have powerful conversations, let's go. The major thing that I noticed when I leveled up is I think less. It's a weird thing. It's like, weirdly, your mind is using thought both to help you because you're having rational thought as, you know, as Ayn Rand and the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged would talk about the logical mind being very beautiful. But there's this overwhelm of thought where there's a master-slave relationship between, the, between thinking and your conscious willpower. And what happened is like, you struggle to get present, you can't get present, and your mind is flooding you with thinking and over flooding you with thoughts as a way of dominating you. And literally, it's like the tail is wagging the dog. You ever heard that idea? Tail is wagging the dog, say that with me. Tail wagging the dog. So like, you are supposed to be, you know, the rider and the mind is the horse. But what happens is that the mind starts riding you. The mind starts riding you. And so a lot of these things that you see, which you believe are real, are beyond fake, okay? They are beyond an illusion. And here's what they are. You'll think as an example, that like just easy examples, but then we can make them more complex. You hear a lot of people talking about how they're victimized, and they probably were. I mean, it's horrifying what happened. It's really, really sad. But the thing is, if all that you do is spend a lot, if you spend a bunch of your time talking about how you got victimized, what is that burning? Opportunity cost. Say that word, opportunity cost. Opportunity. Yes. So what, it, so what it's doing is if you, were to, if you were to say to yourself, okay, I was like, let's say that you literally like for 10 years in a row were tied up and just person after person after person just came and tormented you verbally, physically, probing you, doing things to you. You know, maybe you got abducted by an alien. This happened, right? <clears throat> okay. 
And now and that happened from age 12 to 22. And literally your mind is horrified. Well, I mean, definitely do some trauma release and, you know, get some therapy and, and do what you can to heal that. But end of the day, if you're 22, you, you could very well still have to 82 very easily. That's still another 60 years. But if all that you do is think about what happened to you over and over and over, and that's running you and you're looping on that again and again, that is your own jailer. It's actually because it's burning down your opportunity cost while you're living in the past. The past is done. At this point, the past is an illusion. It might have altered your brain a bit to where you're so traumatized that you're kind of freaked out. But at the end of the day, we live, you know, we, we play the hand we're dealt and it just is what it is. You can feed that and just keep watering that and be like, oh, what happened is so bad, what happened? And you can just keep watering that and growing that or you can say, look, you know, I'm gonna do some trauma healing. I'm gonna try to let this go. I'm gonna try to heal this and do that as efficiently as I can and, and, and have self-care. But beyond that, whatever happened, happened. I gotta move on, you know, and, and there's still another 60 years left. That's those first, you know, that was a decade there, but there's still these other six decades that that story hasn't been written yet. And what kind of life experience and happiness do I wanna have? And so what it is, it's burning, it's burning opportunity costs. Now, what are you gonna notice in people that are imp impoverished? They will tend to talk a lot about victimization, complaints, and the major theme is, I'm at the effect. Just say that word so that you can recognize it in others that are stuck. Say, I'm at the effect. Okay, so they feel at the effect. Now, ironically, it is a little bit of a chicken at the effect. And it's a bit of a chicken and an egg thing, right? It's a bit of a chicken and an egg thing. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Because when you're in poverty, you probably did get victimized. When you're in poverty, you kind of are at the effect. But the problem is if you loop on that and you stay there, you can't climb out either, right? It's like if you fell in a pit and, you, and, and that's like unfair that you fell into a pit with spikes in it, you know, it's kind of fair to complain about it and to say this sucks and to, and to feel sorry for yourself and to feel victimized if someone shoved you in. And, and it's real, but the only way out of it is to focus on the climb up. It's not to just be in the pit and just, I'm in a pit, I'm in a pit, they did it, I'm in a pit, right? It's, it's a looping thing. Everybody in life is gonna have you know, challenges to various degrees, some more, some less. And sometimes even rich people that look like they have it all, they have challenges that you might not even understand because they don't have evolutionary pressure in many cases and that can actually create depression and drug addiction. And that's why a lot of very rich people, like rich kids commit suicide. That's real. That's a real thing. Look, I made a joke the other day in a video that I was creating where I was saying like, oh, you know, I watched this uh, old movie called The Never Ending Story. And I made, a, I, I made sort of a dark, I sometimes use a bit of dark humor and I made a dark humor joke. I'm like, ah, that, that guy probably got a crack, a crack habit and killed himself by now, you know, child star. And I was like, nah, The Never Ending Story kid wouldn't do that. And actually that was true. The Never Ending Story kid did never do that. Uh, but The Never Ending Story Part 2, the sequel, a kid named Jonathan Brandis did actually kill himself. And it's very sad, right? Now, we look at Jonathan Brandis, such a good-looking guy, everybody wants to date him, probably had a bunch of money, and so on and so forth. He's got fame, he's popular, and he commits suicide. Now, you'd look at that in your situation and say, oh, he had it all. He had everything. Well, you know what? Problems can come in different ways. People in the most poor country in the world could think that your life has no problems because you live in America, but yet your problems are real to you. So problems are also subjective. What you need to understand here though, is that anything from, let's look at what you see a lot in people that are poor. And again, I'm not judging, I'm just trying to audit. A lot of complaining, a lot of victimization, a lot of being at the effect, a lot of drug and alcohol consumption, oftentimes a lot of domestic abuse and horrific assaults domestically, you'll see a lot of that. And a big one that you'll see is also trash talking other people who are not there, doing a lot of trash talking. What happens as an example when you trash talk people who aren't present? You break trust with other people who you're trash talking with. If me and you sit here and we start trash talking Sid, you might enjoy that for a minute, but what are you thinking in the back of your mind as I'm getting off on doing that with you? Gonna that I'm gonna do it to you, right? And what if a wealthy one-on-one -on -one client might be watching this, somebody who runs a huge company, and they see some video where I'm like, this person sucks, they're stupid, and I'm right, and they're wrong, and they see that, now I can't get multimillionaire clients very easily. What billionaire is gonna look at a video like that and say, oh, I should hire them? Because they know that if they have a falling out with you, you're gonna put them on blast. You're gonna air their dirty laundry. So yes, maybe you can have the, you know, that initial fun of getting high. But while you're getting high, high level people probably don't wanna work with you. Maybe you have that initial fun of talking trash, but high level people don't wanna work with you. Maybe you have that fun of complaining and it feeds some need in your soul, a dark part, but guess what? Now you burn your opportunity costs. So understand that most of life is actually relatively easy. It's actually relatively easy. It is the maze of our minds, the illusions of Maya, 
this illusion that is in front of us that actually makes what is easy very hard. Now let's go back to that example. Is it easy to go and talk to somebody? Yes, it is. You just go up and you start talking. But when it becomes hard is when the mind floods you with excuses and so on and so forth. But what's never been done is a true audit of opportunity cost. You never say to yourself, what does that cost you to, you know, what, is it, what, is, what does it cost you to make an excuse? And is that one excuse really the, the, the whole picture? No, because you have action taking momentum and execution momentum and you have excuse making momentum. Okay, say the word action taking momentum. momentum. Excuse making momentum. momentum. So what happens is that when I go and then I go hump like that, it's excuse making momentum. You ever heard that expression? If you want something done, give it to a busy person. That's because they have control over their mind at a higher level than someone who's not busy in many cases. So you could have somebody who's incredibly busy with so much to do, but you give them one more thing, they'll probably do it because they'll write it down, because they're accountable, because they're in momentum, because they have control over their psyche. So it, in many ways, in social skills, that ability just to go up and say hi, it looks like it's just going up to say hi, but it's actually a small victory that is building momentum momentum towards larger victories because you're learning to control your mind. That's why for someone in their early 20s, learning social skills is so powerful because it familiarizes you with all these excuses that your mind is making. It familiarizes you with how to take control of your own emotional state. I remember growing up suicidally depressed. To get better socially, I had to take complete control over my emotions. Rather, When you're suicidal, you're, you're ultimately at the effect of your emotions, the point you end your own existence. When you're learning the kind of skills that I had to do, I had to be in control of my own emotions, in control in control my own validation, in control my own self-perception, in control my own self-love, in control my own emotional state, getting in state and self-initiating that. So that's what we're getting at here is that the mind tricks you. So see, a lot of what I'll teach you is about how to execute. We're up here teaching you execution, but in reality, that's the first step. The first step is allowing it to be hard. The first step is looking at things like a morning routine, looking at things that are difficult and actually taking control. That first step is getting out of the derp state and saying, I don't want to be on the phone. Repeat these after me. Autopilot, Autopilot. path of least resistance, resistance. and numb. numb. Okay, autopilot, Autopilot. path of least resistance, and numb. numb. Autopilot, Autopilot. path of least resistance, and numb. Sounds like a self-help course in 50 years from now when the darkness takes over. Now, <laughs> right? It's your fault. Be numb. Path of least resistance, right? They'll have dopamine drips right into the brain in 50 years from now, I bet. Oh, it's going to be a different world. Now, going, okay, that's when they're going to take your soul. That's why I gave a lot of that speech from before because things are about to get a little different in the world. Now, go, and that's why this is so important. Now, going from there, okay, when AI comes out, what are you going to have to offer? It's coming. They're already going to, if you look at your phone after this talk, they're already going to have custom videos based on topics from this because they're listening to your phone even when it's off. And I sound nuts when I'm saying that, and yet go look at your feed after this. And some of these videos are going to be pretty good. <laughs> That's what's so bad about it. You're like, this is really good. This is a great algorithm. This AI guy's really smart. Or girl, whatever, right? So, okay. So going from that standpoint, the mind makes it hard. Whatever level of energy that you're at, whatever paradigm that you're at, your mind is going to choose if something can be easy or hard. On a great night out socially, as an example, how easy is it on a great night out? Easiest thing in the world. I used to observe this when I used to go out. I was like, I was like, this is so easy. It's like, they all just want to meet you. They all want to get to know you. They all want to run off into the night with you. They all want to. Why am I making this so hard? I'm like, why even teach this? They all just all want to meet you. Just go. Goodbye. I'm going to teach something else. Just they all want to meet you now. Go. Goodbye. That's it. Even money making. When you get good at money making, you're like, there's like trillions of dollars to get. Just go. Like there's a stream of trillions of dollars. Just put your head in the little stream and take the money. Goodbye. Like why am I just look? Just go get it. Go get the money. Okay. Go do the social. Just go get it. Go be healthy. Go be happy. Like it's all so easy when you're in the right flow, isn't it? It's the easiest thing in the world. Why is that? Because you shut off the, the self sabotage. That's why you're shutting it off. When you're seeing me doing the speech here at this volume, at this focus mentally, without even a prepared script, why is that? Because I'm in a reality where it is easy. So take note of that as you're seeing it. I'm making it easy. I'm not coming in here like, okay, I'm a little nervous. All right, this is all really hard. What does everybody think of me, right? If I'm in here worrying what you're thinking of me, how much of my mental capital am I burning up? How much opportunity costs am I burning up by worrying what you're thinking? Okay, I want to instead stop worrying about what you're thinking and rather just use that exact same mental bandwidth to make a great speech 
and then just observe, and, and then having that extra mental bandwidth, I can look at your pupils, see if you're engaged or not, and modify and calibrate my approach. But if I care too much what you think, I don't have the mental bandwidth to modify and care about how to modify to you. You see that? So that so ironically, what happens is we get so bogged down in thinking too much that it makes life too hard. Why is that? I jokingly call that the cess, the satanic entertainment system. It is the fact that we eat food with minimal nutrition in it. So our brains are deprived of micronutrients or certain other macronutrients. Then we are underslept because we wake up with an alarm and there's artificial street light shooting through the window because you're not sleeping in the dark. Then you wake up and have coffee or tea, which is actually has a lot of health components. But if you're doing that to mask being underslept is further depriving your brain of the chance to re be regenerative. Then what we do is we consume attention span shortening media. You might notice I've tried to get blowback on that by releasing very, very long videos. I'm fighting a losing battle, but I love you, so I'll keep doing it. Yeah. Okay, long form stuff. And that's another thing. So, it sh so now your brain is undernourished, underslept, under attention, and then you're also demoralized because many of the role models that you're seeing in society are just being trendy and going with the flow and basically preaching degeneracy, which by the way is fun. I don't care, I actually think that's entertaining. I'm not scared of that. But if you view that as a Tony Robbins manual, that's a problem and a lot of people do. So, and, and then we get to the point where people in society are all demoralized and so you don't even feel like you wanna help, help your fellow human beings because you probably know they wouldn't really help you. So you're like, well, why would I even do this? Why would I sacrifice myself to do this when at the end of the day, nobody is going to even care. And that's another a form of demoralization that occurs, right? When you're just like, why would I make the sacrifice when no one's going to care anyway? They wouldn't do it for me. But now it's like, it's like a, in an airplane, if one person reverses the seat, then the next person does, the next person does, the next person does. So once one person doesn't care and you get traumatized by that, then you stop caring, other people stop caring, boom, and society breaks down. It just takes one person to, to start to reverse that trend. Do you understand? There's a great story about a, about a kid who's on the beach and he's throwing starfish back into the beach because the tide is pulled out. And there's these starfish that are getting burnt by the sun because the tide is pulled out. And he starts throwing or she starts throwing those starfish right in the ocean. And this wise adult comes and says, you know what? You're never gonna save all the starfish. So don't throw the starfish back in the ocean. And the kid, the dumb kid in that dumb wisdom looks at the adult and says, you idiot and keeps throwing them back in the ocean. And the lesson there is that, there's a, is that there's a wisdom being an adult in recognizing that maybe, maybe it is a losing fight. Maybe no matter what humanity does, the sun will explode someday and we're gonna be dead. Maybe the universe is gonna end and we're gonna be dead. But it's not about the fact that the fight will be lost or that you'll die or that humanity will die. It's what we do while we're here. That's what's important that when we meet our creator, that we know that we did what we could while we're here. And that's what's gonna change your mind into an entirely different paradigm. And that is priceless, but they're not gonna sell you that because they're not, it's just not part of that whole system. It's not a part of that. So instead, what's the system gonna do to you? The system at its core is gonna traumatize you. It is gonna traumatize you and demoralize you and confuse you to the point that you don't even know up from down anymore. And that's what's gonna go on. And then what'll happen is like, it's like you're this ascending balloon, but they're gonna come in and they're gonna shoot the spear at you, right? And that's the trauma. You know, maybe somebody's rude to you. Maybe somebody makes you feel like there's no point. Maybe somebody makes you feel like if you're a good person that other people won't appreciate it. Boom, it shoots into you, right? And that's that first trauma. And now that's in your system. They've traumatized you. And then you start to feel bad and demoralized. Maybe you're just in a transactional mindset. What can I get? How can I get what I want? How can I only be in my body and never in my soul? You start to feel that way. And so then what happens is that you start to get numb. Because you're traumatized, numbness is perceived as entertainment. Numbness, say that with me. Numbness is perceived as entertainment. Say it again. Numbness is perceived as entertainment. Okay? Path of least resistance is perceived as good. Say that. Path of least resistance is perceived as good. Autopilot feels relaxing. Autopilot feels relaxing. Not being in that front part of your brain. But over time, what you'll realize is that you actually gain energy from using the prefrontal cortex. You gain energy from being outside of autopilot. And that's where learning how to execute comes in. Learning to be an executor is that point where you say to yourself, you know what, I'm gonna learn to execute, and when I do, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna begin to put a stake in the ground and say, no, this is me. I'm not just gonna be asleep. I'm not just gonna sit there in a derp daze in this walking days, being manipulated and used as fodder for some evil force. I'm not gonna do that. Instead, 
I'm going to build something. And it's that first ability to maybe learn social skills, to build a small business, maybe to get a raise at work, maybe to be to build a philanthropy or to help other people, maybe to build a sport or music or a skill or something like that. That's when you're forced to break out of that satanic entertainment system and to actually begin to wake up. And so to do that, the main key is you have to embrace cortisol. Say that with me. Embrace cortisol. Embrace discomfort. The edge is the comfort zone. Okay, and so that is what begins to happen. And we can show you different exercises that will help you to break out of that. Now, what will happen there is life's going to get hard because you're going to have the end of the day, you're going to be tired and you're going to crave relaxation and you're going to crave a break and you're going to want to get high and drunk and numb and fit in and be trendy and get stuff. And you're going to want all of that. You're going to want to fall asleep. And that's okay. That's okay. It's fine. But what's going to happen from there is you're going to realize that's not the path. And as you begin to carve out that ability to actually put a stake in the ground and say, no, okay, no, I don't want your autopilot. I don't want your numbness. I don't want your trendiness. I don't want your system. I am not your freaking food. I'd rather die than be in the system. As soon as you do that, now you're beginning to wake up. And then what happens, then that's when you can start to make things easier, okay? That's when life can get a little bit easier because what happens is you start saying to yourself, how am I making this hard though, right? Because you, you've heard the whole like kind of Gary Vaynerchuk style teaching, which I love by the way, love. And you'll say, you got to hustle. He says, hustle till your face melts off your skull, right? And I've lived that and I've done that. And I think it's beautiful. I love that he does that. He's helping mothers and fathers to build a small business in every spare moment they have after work. And that's real. But at a certain point, you know what you can begin to realize? The real difficulty is the illusion in the mind. You're making it hard. You're taking something simple and making it hard. You're taking something simple and making it hard. In reality, say social skills, meeting someone, maybe someone to date or network or make friends with. Is it really that hard to be confident, to go up, to joke around, to be yourself? They're not making it hard. Who's making it hard? You are making it hard. Okay, you are making it hard. So I'm going to give you a thought experiment, okay, to build off this. I want you to imagine right now, as a thought experiment, that this place, this dimension that we're in, this realm that we're in, is you hiding from God. Okay, this is you as a teenager, your soul is a teenager, and you're throwing a temper tantrum at your parents. Okay, you're like, no, I'm leaving. I hate you. I don't want to live forever. I don't want to have eternal life. I don't want eternal abundance. I don't want love. I don't want creation. I don't want everything awesome. I don't want to feel good. I don't want everything you've given me. I don't want any of it. I'm leaving mom and dad and I hate you. Okay, it's like you ever see a teenager do that? You ever do that to your parents, yeah. right? And God says, I gave you creation. I gave you life. I gave you awareness. I gave you love. I gave you expansion. I gave you eternal life. I gave you everything. But as a teenager, you say, I don't want it. I don't want abundance. I don't like that. I'm going to be spoiled. I don't care that there's oxygen going through my lungs right now. I'm mad. I'm just going to sit here looking at my phone in a little tantrum. I'm going to go burn my brain, Swiss cheese holes in my brain and get drugged out and drunk off my butt and just get super angry and complain and crap talk people and waste my time and be a victim and be at the effect and not take action and not say hi to people and not be present with people and complain and just run away from people that I want to meet and have everything suck because I hate you, daddy. I hate you. I'm mad. But really, you're just a teenager having a temper tantrum, okay? And it's gonna, you're going to have a whole different perspective when you have children of your own. And so that's a temper tantrum. And so what we do as a thought experiment, just a thought experiment, it doesn't mean it's real. As a thought experiment, imagine that we said, I'm going to hide as far away as I can from that abundance. I'm going to hide and run away from it. And so what you did instead is you found other co-enablers to hide with. So everything that you did is meant to keep you here. And the beauty to go home, the beauty of it is so overwhelming. It's so attractive that you have to hide from it, okay? It's like the sun is so beautiful, but again, we can't look at the sun. We're not capable to look directly, nor should you, by the way, but we're not, unless it's maybe the right time of day, I don't know, but we're not capable of looking at that sun without very, very thick sunglasses. The beauty of life is so incredible. It's so amazing. It is so overwhelming that you can't even look at it. You can't even look at it right in the face. You can't even walk through a park, Central Park, and let it land how beautiful that is. You can't even look a friend in the eye and let it land how beautiful that is. You're scared of it. It's too amazing. It's too beautiful. The basics of life, you can't take a breath 
and feel the beauty of that because it's too beautiful. And so your mind hides from it and you do everything you can to hide from it. And so what you do, think about somebody addicted to drugs. What do they often do? They find another drug addict and they sit there taking drugs. See, he's letting it land. You sit there taking drugs, pounding them down with other drug addicts. What do they call that? A co-enabler, right? Have you ever had it where maybe someone gets in a relationship and they always have a tumultuous relationship? They can only be, they, and he's having the appropriate response, by the way, because he's seeing it, that you can only be in a relationship with somebody else who will make it negative. You can only be in that because you have to hide. It's a co-drug addict enabler. And so something like drugs, that's like they need that strong medicine, baby. They need that strong medicine. I've got to hide. I'm not coming home. I'm going to get high. And so you need something that strong to anchor you here in hell, in this purgatory hell, even though there's lower levels than this, but staying here, okay? What do you see here when you look around? Fish eating each other, animals eating each other, people screwing each other over. Where are we? Wake up! And people don't realize that, so we do anything to keep ourselves here. And all that we do is a distraction, hiding from the opportunity cost, hiding from what's beautiful, hiding from what's powerful, hiding from your gift that you've been given. It's all here to disconnect you and to keep you here to drain energy right off of your soul and to eat it alive and suck you in the pit of hell. Okay, and you'll sit there and then you'll violate yourself and you'll do something sick and disgusting. And when you do that, you go more down deep into the pit and you sell yourself out and you sell out your soul, your friends, the people you love, this opportunity, you sell out the moment, you sell out everything for what? For some sick distraction that is disgusting, for dopamine, to talk crap, to feel good, to get ego, to have attachment. It's sick, it's sick, it's sick, it's sick. Wake up. So that's what we do. In reality, most of life is so easy. It's given to us. It's given to us. We have that ability, but we have to learn how to manifest energy, how to summon the energy, how to get out of our own way, open up the mind and let it flow through. And so just what you're seeing me here doing now speaking, all that I'm doing, this is not speaking technique. This is me not getting in my own way. If you've seen videos of me out of the bar or club, having fun with everybody, I'm not getting in my own way. When you watched me build an eight-figure business in a niche that was the hardest to build it in ever, it was not me getting in my own way, okay? I woke up, I learned, at, at a young age, I learned how to execute. I learned how to make it hard, I learned how to make it hard, how to wake up out of a derpy autopilot, path of least resistance, numb as good trance. I woke myself up out of that by making it hard. That's the first step, going from derper to executor. But then we go from executor to transcendent. We say to ourselves, why am I making this so hard? Why is my viewing this difficult? Why am I making this painful? Why am I thinking about this crap? I'm wasting my life on this. So that is the idea of saying to yourself, what is the opportunity cost? How do you detect at a core level, in my view, in my personal view, what is the beauty of life? There's books like the Tao Te Ching that are so beautiful. You can read the Bible. You can read the Bhagavad Gita. You can read the power of now and look at these things and get present for a moment. You know, Allow your mind to align to the Tao, as they would say. Allow your mind to align to source. And ask yourself, out of all this crap that I'm looking at and wasting my time with, out of all of it, what resonates? What resonates with ease? So see, at a lower level, say to yourself, how do I get out of autopilot? How do I embrace cortisol? How do I discipline myself? How do I make it hard? Because you're not at that level yet. But it's like a body, you have the skeleton and you have the flesh. And so the skeleton, that's the execution. Does somebody who's in a derp state need to just sit there and meditate? No. Does somebody in a derp state need to make it easier? No. They need to be okay with making it harder. But then as you go along with that, you can come full circle and all of a sudden, here's the big joke, it's easier, easier to be at a transcendent high execution level than it is to be a derper. It is easier for me to sit up here giving my energy by not getting out of my own way than it would be for me to sit on the couch eating Cheetos. Do you understand that? This is easy what I'm doing. Does that make sense? Yes. This is easy. Yes. Okay? Making money from, an from a derp level standpoint is impossible. From an execution level standpoint is hard. And from a transcendent standpoint is easy. So we come full circle. We come full circle. So what I want you to do the first thing is you're gonna to get together and you're gonna make a list and you're gonna look at every single area that you're not stepping up. And how and I want you to give me a list of how you'd make your life really, really hard and ask yourself, what would life look like? 
What could you make your life look like if you just made it really, really hard? And what could you get in doing that? And then what I would ask you is how could you then come full circle in the next discussion with each other and how could you make your life very, very easy and what could you give? What could you give? Okay, when people tell you it's all in the giving, that's not just a cliche to guilt trip you. But in many ways, when it's not explained properly, it kind of is. So I want you to understand it. So how could you make it easier and what could you give? And you need to have both. You need to learn how to make it hard and get. And you need to learn how to make it easy and give. So keep that in your mind. And believe, once, by the way, once you've heard that thought experiment, this, just as a thought experiment, doesn't mean it's real, as a thought experiment, that you're hiding from God in a temper tantrum, you can never unsee it. You can never unsee it. Just like a lot of the old real life interactions I'd film and you see certain off the wall things, you can never unsee that. Once you've seen that thought experiment, you will look at everybody who you see and you're like, wow, they're actually, a, like you look at someone maybe who's homeless or maybe somebody who's mad or somebody who's broke and you're like, they're a genius. They're a genius. They're really hiding. They're doing like, this is like hide and go seek. Like they're like hide and go seek and like they're hiding amazing. Because the beauty of where you're drawn back to is so beautiful that you need to, like, you, like some people need even stronger and stronger things to hide. You'll realize when you look at people, they're hiding. They're hiding from their greatness. It's incredible. They're hiding from, you are hiding from your greatness. Okay? You're hiding from it. And that's not just cliche. That's not like a warm, like, self, like you're hiding from your greatness. Like, I know, I'm great. Yeah. It's not that. This is real. You're hiding from your greatness. There's greatness inside of you. Okay, what I talked about in our last segment about how I drove a whole team of people into their greatness, this is what, well, what I was in their ear with, moving towards that greatness and what they could give, okay? And you can do this. You can be elite. You can be world-class. You can be legendary. You can be your potential. You can go back to your creator and know that you gave your best and that you gave your all. You can do this, and this is worth more than anything. So wake up, okay? Get up now. Up now. And what we're going to do is A, go through what your best life would look like and what execution and routine you would need to get there. And then B, from that standpoint, we're going to be looking at how to make it easy. All the wasted thoughts, wasted actions, like Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, every movement would be efficient. What movements, thoughts, behaviors, actions, associations, lifestyles, habits, hobbies, what resonates with you in the flow? Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great job. That's fucking awesome. Thank you. <laughs>
That's why I say I love all people, even the worst people, because even their existence is so rare in this universe that while I would stop them from their behavior and don't condone it, I will still have love for them. Do you understand? That's a very, very important thing. It's also something talked about in the Bible as well. Anybody can love someone who's nice to them, but can you have love for somebody who wasn't so nice to you? And that's a very, very powerful frame to be coming from because at that point, you're accessing that higher consciousness when you realize that there's a place in you that is untouchable and there's never a threat, okay? So this is getting you to access into that, not just the physical intelligence that's against everything else. So begin to wake up. Is everybody here waking up? Yeah! Okay, so what you're gonna do, get in your groups, talk about A, Anything that you want to do right now, immediately, as something that you could do just to get to that next level, even to make a couple extra bucks. But then ask yourself, you remember that what I talked about about execution the other night? Ask yourself, what execution could you build? What skills could you build? I wasn't, you know, when I was first learning at 22, I just want to get a date. I wasn't thinking that deeply about it. But how can you also see a step forward to add further motivation onto you, to activate that higher part of yourself, to, add, to awaken your soul into that flow and begin to find those little moments and eventually come to live there. I don't believe our peak is at 30. I don't believe our peak is at 40. I think our peak can be a lot older, but like a flower that's blossoming, you wanna give your chance, yourself the chance to truly blossom into what you're capable of. And you are capable of so much more than you can imagine now. Don't let them trick you into shortchanging yourself. Your moment is coming. The test is here and it's gonna be beautiful. So let's get in groups right now. Let's think about this for a minute and let's talk about A, immediate focuses that you can do and what you're going to learn from that and be what it would mean to find a championship window and where you could do something truly legacy defining so that we have people coming right out of this group here now today that truly bring the ball down the field for humanity okay hop up let's get in up you get up 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 get in your groups The next thing that we're gonna do in this is I want you to start imagining that third piece that we talked about, which is what it would mean to be able to execute at a high level, but to also be optimized for a good mood. And the reason why I'm gonna suggest this to you was um, I study success at a really high level. I love studying success and I'm fortunate because it's my job to do that so I can dedicate a lot of time to it. And success leaves clues. But I also believe that Failure leaves clues. And I, I equally study uh, success and failure. I think it's like, it's one thing to study that person who in the 18 or 1900s or whatever it was, took a dog sled to the North Pole and see how they did it and what they persevered through. And that's really inspiring, right? But in reality, a lot of life is failure. It can be equally good to look at the person who froze to death. <laughs> you know, it can be equally good to do that. And I think there's another form of failure. There, there's another fundamental failure that we can have, and I wanna really help you to guard against that. And here's what it is. The failure that I wanna guard you against is a life that could have a lot of winning, a lot of money, dating, clout, validation, but at the same time, you're unhappy. You make yourself miserable to do it. I've done it. If you think about this for a minute, there's years of my life that I've spent being miserable, accomplishing a lot. And I rationalize that saying legacy, accomplishment, not being lazy. I'll tell you a big one to be real with you. Uh, and, and I think anybody here who's operating at a high gear would relate with this. A lot of why I would try to be successful was less to do with money and more to do with just to be honest, just me not wanting to be a derper. Me just looking at people that are derpers and saying, I don't want to associate with that. That's a philosophy of death. I don't want that. I'm running away from that. So you'll see people that talk about being happy and they start to feel like a bunch of losers talking out of their butt because they're not accomplishing anything, right? The same people, that, and, and, and I really dug in with this too. I really, really dug in. What I did, was I would look, I would go make friends with people that are optimized for happiness and I'd see what their lives look like. And you know what I generally found? They were unhappy. The people who optimized for happiness were actually unhappy. Here's why. They would have to sacrifice everything to the state gods, to the happiness gods. They would reframe everything. They would get high and drunk. They would, many of them steal from good friends. A lot of people that are just obsessed with being happy, on the surface, they look really happy but they steal from their friends. They do that because they'll rationalize anything, rot holes in their brain, rot holes in their soul, 
in order to stay in state. And I observed that. And over time, I realized they're not really that happy. In fact, they carry a lot of regret. I also saw people that are very wealthy, and many of them carried regret. What I commonly saw was entrepreneurs around age, usually you get to that kind of like never work again mode. For a lot of people, it's around 58-ish. You got, you know, it could be 10 million, 100 million, you banked it, you never have to work again. And you see these people that just went in this, just this meat grinder for years, and they finally hit that point where they never have to work again, maybe they're 58, and they look back at their life and you're like, you know, what would you have done different? And they're like, man, should have just been a little, take it a little more easy. I should have been happier. I've been stressed for decades. I keep saying I'll be happy when. I gotta learn to enjoy life. And you know what's kind of cool though? They do start enjoying life and, and they do. Some can't, their brain's been, their, their synaptic superhighways have been rewired to say I'll be happy when, never, in the future, which never comes. You know, almost like you've rewired your brain like a donkey with a carrot permanently in front of it and you're just like this. But many of them actually do become happy. They're like, you know what? I, you know, I had enough of this. I want, to be, I want to become happy. But how's that a win when you're 20s, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58. Oh, now you're going to be happy. All those years, those prime years, you will never get back. They will be stolen from you. And when you, and for me, again, the beauty, when I had to take apart my business, that was a death before death. That was the greatest gift for me. Because what happened was, I had to honestly confront how I'd been behaving. And I think I had a lot of fun. Look, I went out to great clubs, met great people, had a great social life, dating life, friendship life. Look, I did a lot of great stuff. I did more than most people would do. But at the same time, I hadn't done anything for myself in years. I had to realize, like, wait a minute, maybe I can just go skiing and not answer my phone for a couple of days. I remember just skiing, and I'm like, I, like and you know what was so crazy? I, I, I loved skiing growing up. I skied at this place called Camp Fortune outside of Ottawa growing up. And, and like, I'm skiing, and I, kept, like, I, I was an active skier until maybe like 16, 18, probably, probably 16. And I kept saying, I'm gonna get back into skiing at some point. And decades go by, and I just never get back into skiing. And you know, I'm like, you know, I'll probably go up to Aspen at some point. I actually did go to Aspen in like 2006. And I'm like, that's not that long ago, right? You know, it's 2020, 2006, 14 years, they will breeze by so fast. And my buddy Jesse hit me up. And he, and he said, oh, you're going to be going to Jackson Hole. I'm like, yeah, I'm going there to shoot, get this video blog done, or this video backlog done. And he says, Owen, go skiing. I'm like, yeah, cool, I'll do a skiing video. He goes, Owen, which, I, I, which by the way, I did do a skiing video, but I didn't, <laughs> but I took a whole day is not, a bunch of days not um, uh, shooting as well. So I, he says, Owen, go skiing. And I'm like, yeah, I'll shoot a video. And he, and he says, Owen, and, and my buddy Jesse, he's a very successful guy. He's got, a, he's got a lot of successful friends. They all love me. He says, Owen, I got to be real with you. He's like, me and, me and the boys, like, we love you. We love your content. We watch it. We love you. We get value from it. But like, we never want to invite you anywhere because we know that you're just going to show up with your whole squad shooting the whole time and just creating content the whole time and answering calls the whole time. And he's like, you got to learn how to chill out. And that was a tough one for me. I'll tell you why, okay? So this was in that phase, along, along our little story that we're sharing here. This was in that phase where I had rebuilt the business, okay? Because remember, you can say, oh, and just take time off. But I was in a position where I was going with what I knew. Like at the point where I had to dismantle the company around 2018, I was going with what I knew. And what I knew is hard work, execution, and folks, I've done that for many years. So I used the tools that I knew at that time to rebuild the company. So I just stayed, like, do you ever find it weird seeing me stay up here in this locked in gear hour after hours? Does that ever feel weird? Like you're seeing kind of a cartoon character? I trained myself to do that to save the business. So what happened was I'm sitting there and, and, and I knew that was gonna happen when I went into that kind of edgy content, but I just loved it so much that I was just ready to die for it, to be real with you. So I got to the point where, you know, I, like, as I built that content, I was sinking all my own money into it, funding everybody else's brands, building it. Like, I was, I was a man on a mission. And I don't regret it. I'm so proud of what I did. But here's just what I learned that I do differently now, and I wanna show this to you now, so that if you do this heroic movement, whatever it is that you do in your life, I want you to have these lessons now, today. I wanna to save decades of your life. 
And of course, when you've had to live it, you're gonna internalize it deeper than just hearing it. But as you stumble, you can come back to what you're learning here, okay? And it, it'll make sense over time. So again, like I said, I, I, it first started to, real, to dawn on me that something was wrong when, you know, after years and years of building something and being stressed quite, quite often and being a perfectionist, I had to take it down. That's when I was kind of like, I should just been happy. But then what happened was I still had to fight and claw to keep the vision going. I could have backed down. I could have just gone to shooting videos on an iPhone and I would have been making a seven figure a year personal salary. I could, you know, I could have probably paid myself two, three million bucks a year making videos off an iPhone and it would have been great, but I didn't want to back down. I wanted to keep the infrastructure, keep the movement, keep the production value, keep everything. I wanted to keep it all. I wasn't, I was ready. That, that was the hill I was ready to die on. I wasn't going to, I had to retreat in many areas, but that was the last hill. There has to be that hill you're ready to die on. So then what happened was I, I just grind out for a couple years. But then after that, lockdown, right? And, and I'm just sitting there, I'm like, I'm like, what would I do different? And literally, I can't run seminars. I can't, I can't go to bars and clubs. Everyone's locked down. I didn't know what was gonna happen, to be honest with you, right? I'm having to do, you know, our revenues dip by about 90%. I'm going in the hole at a rate of about 900,000 a month. Okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're bleeding out about 900K a month at this point. So I'm sitting there looking at this and I'm going, you know, do I need to, you know, but I can abandon ship, right? I could, I could cut all those expenses, build on the 100, maybe take it to about 350 a month and just pay it to myself. You want to make 350K a month? Is that not too bad? Right? But no, <laughs> right? No. So I'm like, no, I'm not backing down. I'm going to find another way. So one thing I did was I said to myself, there's a number of different lessons that I got, okay? One of them, frankly, was this. There's so many higher level paradigms that you're choosing to ignore. And I had to be honest with myself and be like, Owen, is there things here that you're not seeing that you could easily be doing to turn the situation around? Is there maybe opportunities that you have that you're not seeing that could turn this around? And of course there is, right? One such opportunity was starting to work with heads of big tech companies and huge businesses. And that was immediate. And those are the kind of people that'll pay you 20, 30K an hour to do coaching. So that's one thing that I didn't even think of. And people would, would offer that to me and I would say no in the past. Cause I'm like, it's not legacy, you know, right? So I'm like, you know, so I wouldn't do it. And that was one of the things that I did. Another thing that I realized was many friends of mine had built, many people who I coach into building followings were doing things online that were extremely effective and, I'm, and I said to myself, why do I need to like fly to a different city to do a program when I could build you know, a several month program of mentoring online that would be stickier and better and have a higher retention rate because I built it for, you know, because it goes on for several months, I can bring in celebrity guests, I can refine the content, I can stay on the phone with people for hours, I can build mastermind groups, I can get people results. There's like, I, I've got, I literally put my entire, my entire staff goes in it. My, my, my chief marketing officer, my video editor guys, my video shooters, um, my finance people, they all come into mentoring. Celebrity friends of mine come in, social media influencer friends of mine come in. It's super dope. I can get on there, get everybody on the phone, network, build mastermind groups. Why am I making this so hard that I have to do it only this way? It doesn't, like, yes, keep doing seminars. That's why I'm doing it here. But that doesn't have to be the only thing. Does that make sense? And do you remember the story of when I was hired by Ask Men and that was gonna be worth millions to me? And then because they wanted me to do a video with hair gel, I squirted all this mega gel in my hair, put it all in my remaining hair, like hard like a rock dripping gel, and then ran through the streets like going crazy. Any of you guys remember that? Yeah, because what happened was, I was, I was making videos that were true to my soul. Ask Men came in. They're making, they were the biggest website before social media. This was before social media, like 2003 or four, whatever, whatever it was. And they asked me to do videos that were very mainstream. And, and, and I, I did a couple. And then finally, I'm like, no, because they said, I want you to do a video on how hair gel could be a sleek look. And I'm like, hair gel is nothing. It's all about your skills. And it made me angry. So I made this video where I dumped hair gel into all through my hands had it soaking off me and then ran through the streets doing my thing, you know, and just showing it didn't matter. And then at the end of the video, I scream at the camera. I'm like, it doesn't matter. And I go crazy and I sent it to them and got fired. So it was like, you ever hear the jet blue guy that on a, he did the epic quit where he put the, uh, the, the, the slide out of the plane. He's just like, you know, and he just like got out of there. That was kind of my moment like that. But in reality, why didn't I just do basic videos for five minutes for ask men, submit them, have that as a lead funnel, 
into my content that I love, which could have funded it, and then I could have been shooting on Ari Alexas and red cameras and have like Steven Spielberg be the director. But no, I'm an artiste. Everything has to be super hard and difficult. You know, it's like, it's like the, the starving artist that drinks absinthe, right? Like this like brutal alcohol. Well, I don't really know if it is or not, but you know that I, the idea of it or how they thought of it at the time. It's like you're making it hard. So I had to say to myself, Owen, why are you making this so hard? Yes, it's good that you have the perfectionism. It's good that you want to go hard. It's good you want to leave a legacy. But can you make this easier? Is there an easier way to do it? And so I had to start thinking like that because the paradigm that I was working at, I couldn't budget it. So I had to start thinking a little bit different. And what I realized, oh my goodness, there, there was so many opportunities, so many that I had that I'd been ignoring because I was like this complete, utter tunnel vision to be the best speaker I could be, the best video creator I could be, and all this stuff, and just working obsessively on this, not willing to give up a single second, and just pausing and looking at the opportunities that were there, I was able to rebuild so quickly, and without the baggage of the people who jumped ship, and not having to deal with them anymore, people who weren't really in it for the long haul. So it actually was like a purging for me. It was like a shedding. It was like a really good experience. So coming from that standpoint, I realized, You've got to make it also easy on yourself. And see, with that extra time that I had, now all of a sudden I became more efficient and that's what allowed me to start to travel and create the backlog that's about to come out in later in 2022. Now, another weird epiphany that I even had was I was like, I'm not releasing anything on my main channel until the backlog is done. But then what I realized, I'm like, well, my channel's empty. Now we have a great following, it's going awesome, but why am I not putting anything on my channel other than just lives? Right now, I'm just doing lives all the time. You guys remember that? So I said to myself, well, let's say that I'm in New Mexico and I've driven out to some epic bridge. I'm there in golden hour. You know, I'm dressed, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to shoot. And I'm shooting a segment for like my masterpiece, perfection video and all that kind of stuff. If I'm already there, why not just make like an 18 minute video in one shoot of something basic and simple that the, that the people may enjoy quickly, something straightforward, put it out, and have some videos come out in between. And that was the last three weeks for me. I don't know if you all noticed, I had a quick short video come out and they weren't my best videos and they weren't a masterpiece, but they're shot in beautiful locations. They've got good, clean foundational content. People are enjoying them. And all that it took me was 17 minutes not to have my channel empty for the week. And all that it took was 17 minutes. That's all it took. And you know what? It's the, my version of a perfect videos will come out later. But why not just make foundational videos? Do you think people might enjoy a video about how to make an introduction, how to be self-amused, how to control the frame, how to build confidence, how to take action, just simple basic stuff that everybody needs that probably produce 80% of the results anyway, <laughs> you know? So I just started putting out stuff like that and I'm gonna keep doing that. But you know, even for me, that was a success barrier. To put out a video that's easy was a success barrier. I had, I, like, as I was doing it, I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Even as I put it out, I could barely sleep. I'm like, I can't believe I put out a video that wasn't like the ultimate video. And I'm like, no, but Owen, you're building that now. Just keep people engaged in the meantime. You don't need to do it like this, right? My friend Elliot Hulse, if anybody follows him, yeah. you might remember back in like 2015, he was like, I'm not gonna go on the internet for like a year. And I was like, Elliot, just make a, do a pre-shoot of, of like, you know, 300 videos that you could probably do in like, like Elliot's a genius. He could probably do like one of the best video shooters, could even be the best of all time. You could do this in like three days and then take your year off. He's like, no, I'm going down, right? Like, cause he was gonna kind of go down into his pit and like wallow in it, which was part of his growth. Cause he's planning his roots. He's gonna shoot up and he did that. He really did do it, but he's making it hard. But I do that too. I have that same pattern. He'd have his own view on that, by the way. You should really hear it from him, not me. I just sort of give him my little take, but he'd have his take. I hate it when people give take on me and I'm not there. I'm like, I have a different take. So he'd have his own take. But what I'm saying is that you don't have to make it hard. You can make it easy. So that's the first idea. Stop making it hard. Then ask yourself another question. How are you honestly, go back to that hiding from God experiment. How are you hiding from God in that thought experiment? In other words, how are you creating, and repeat this after me, Self-created resistance. Say that word. Self-created resistance. Okay, another word of it is self-generated resistance. Self -generated. So what you're doing is you're, is you're actually creating your own resistance. You're addicted to things being hard. When I see, have you ever, have you ever dated somebody and you're not that into them and they obsess over you and then you later realize they don't even know you and they're just using the fact that, that you're unavailable to make themselves miserable. And if you actually were available to them, they wouldn't want you. 
but they're using your unavailability to make themselves miserable. You ever seen that? I always have a couple of those. <laughs> you know, I've always got a couple. Of, it's like, I'm just, I'm unavailable. I'm dating a few different people and they don't know me. We've never had a deep conversation. We, we have literally no connection at all and they think they're in love with me. And then I'll test it. I'll actually test it. Here's how I came to this insight. I'll be like, you know what? We should be a couple. Within a day, they dump me. <laughs> because I was co, and it's not just the alpha beta thing. I was co-enabling with them, co-enabling with them for them to make themselves miserable. Now that I can't, you know, I've had it before. People who I work with, and I'm such a people pleaser, they'll, they'll say, Owen, I want this. I don't like this. I don't like this. I'm like, I'm like, when I met you, you were, you were a college dropout. You're now a millionaire. Like, why are you so mad at me? They're like, yeah, but still, I could have been like a million point two millionaire because of you, you know? And I'm like, I'm so sorry. What do I need to do? Ah! You know, and I'm like, like do anything. And I get in this pattern where I'm trying to fix it and fix it and fix it and fix it. And what always happened every single time bar none is when I would fix every single thing, they leave. They're like, you know, you really made a good effort, but uh, goodbye, and they just leave, you know? And, and this happened to me again and again, because it's looking, it's, it's like, Things are too awesome. Worldwide fan base, millions of dollars, people loving what you do, building a legacy, creating something from that will go beyond the great. It's like, it's too awesome. Can't process it, don't have the roots to process that. So what you've got to do is ask yourself, where are you generating your own resistance? Where are you a drug addict? An incredible person named Gaber Mate wrote a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And the premise of it is that we look down on people addicted to drugs when we are all addicted to drugs. That person who maybe uses me being unavailable as a way to drive themselves nuts is hiding from God in the same way that a drug addict is hiding from God. In the same way that when you look in your phone too much, like at a rate that's too high, hiding from God. In the same way that when you hurt yourself, hiding from God. It's that thought experiment. You don't have to believe in that, but as a thought experiment. What's that? In the realm of hungry ghosts. And it's this idea that we, we thumb our nose at someone addicted on cocaine, but they're hiding from their greatness in the way that we do as well. Maybe we do it compulsive shopping, but go into your mind. It's like, once you see this thought experiment, you can't unsee it. Like it's the, the it's, it, yes, it's like, I love that idea. Again, the Bible, you don't even have, you don't have to be a Christian to appreciate it. This idea of the golden calf, worshiping something other than that creative force. And so ask yourself, if you look at the, if you look at books like the Tao Te Ching, read that. And you know, even if you're a Christian, read it anyway. It's powerful. They're not, people think it's like, it's like these different tribes and camps, but there's so many similarities that you can learn. And in the Tao Te Ching, they taught like, what you basically learn, like you'll even learn this in social skills and people who you meet. If you're just present, you stay present and act from there, you know that it's gonna be amazing whatever you do. And anytime that you get off that kilter, you know you're probably just creating problems for yourself. But again, it's that golden calf you're worshiping something other than that creative force. Sometimes they call that worshiping the creation instead of the creator. Now, don't, here's another thing though. What's another form of self-generated resistance? You do this thing where you act through presence and you know, you're very present and you're connected to the Tao. And then maybe on an off day, you're like, I'm not in state. I'm not connected to the Tao. Everything I do is gonna suck. And then you're also making self-generated resistance. You see that? So that's why it's like onion layers. It's like letting go of attachment, but letting go of attachment to non-attachment. Then letting go of attachment to non-attachment to attachment. Letting go of non-attachment to attachment to non-attachment to attachment to attachment. You know, it's like layers, it's like it's just like layers of it, right? Because what happens, you get in that flow and you act better, but then you get addicted on it. And then when you're kind of stuck in your head and you're being in your ego and attachment and general resist resistance, then you're like, no. I can't, anything I do is gonna suck now. It all sucks, it's all bad. No, it's not. You gotta get, that's another thing. Even this idea of, of, of cosmic consciousness, of identifying with the whole, even that has a limit where you can allow yourself to identify with nothingness. Does that make sense? It exists and doesn't exist at the same time. In the Kabbalion, they'd say that, right? Every truth is about a half truth. You, you, you connect to the whole, and yet connect to that inner nothingness and are that simultaneously. That's when things get intense. So just realize that, that paradox, that you can be attached, but you have to let go of attachment. Then you have to let go of attachment to non-attachment. Then you have to let go of attachment to non-attachment to attachment. And da, 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 okay, it goes like that. But understanding that self-generated resistance, you might generate resistance by saying, if I'm not in state, I can't do it. You generate resistance by 
making it harder, generate resistance by ignoring easy options. And so everything is about this one question, repeat after me, say what else? What say, else? It what say, else? It what else? say it again, what else? What else? say it again, what else? What else? say it again, say it again. Excellent, it's what else? Keep asking yourself, yeah, I'm looking at this crap, thinking about this crap, wasting my time on this crap, is it worth it? Is this worth it at all? Is this worth it at all? Connect to presence. Read books like the Tao Te Ching. Connect to that. And then ask yourself, does this resonate with that ease? And if you can start doing less and trying less, what you'll see, just like when you do social interaction, all your best people who you met, the most attractive people who you met, be honest. How did you really meet them? Was it when you were doing a million things? Or was it when you just kind of didn't care? You kind of just floated over? It was easy. It was fun. You're being yourself. Just be it yourself. And then what happened is you just do your thing and it's easy. But you meet someone you really like and you do a little too much. You give away your power and they even really like you, but they're like, there's something a little off and they can feel that. And you're creating your own problems. Right? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're just creating, you're creating your own resistance. But look, we can say that to someone who doesn't have those social skills, somebody who doesn't have that background, who hasn't, who hasn't gone out a couple years. Look, just try less. Is that going to help? No. 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 no, it's like try less. Like, I'm doing that. It's not working, <laughs> right? I'm doing, I'm, I'm already good at that. How come it didn't work, right? So it's all about paradigms. A paradigm is like a chick breaking out of an egg and looking around and it's like a whole new reality. But those paradigms are like Russian dolls. You don't get rid of the inner Russian doll. You integrate and transcend, integrate and transcend, integrate and transcend, integrate and transcend. And this goes on forever, which makes life a very cool video game. So, <laughs> so going from that standpoint, I want you to get together right now and I want you to ask yourself where you're making your life hard. Where are opportunities that you're missing? What is the vital five things that actually work? Not the thousand things that you're thinking about that yield nothing. Get together in groups now, start having conversations about it, and we'll be right back. Up you get. So another quick couple points. Number one is that the paradigm that you're in is going to have a direct correspondence to the level of thinking, the quality of thinking, or level of solution that is presented to you. This needs to be understood. And this is like, like all this fighting that you see in the world, this is a major, major part of it. So in other words, when I'm younger, a lot of these stories that I told you about my struggles and the movement that I wanted to build and the legacy I want to build and the business I want to build, all of these different problems that I had, the solutions were in my face the entire time. In other, like, literally, the solutions were under my nose, like, like problems that caused me to have to walk around like a zombie robot worker for years straight to the point that I would like almost wish a truck would hit me. <laughs> like the solutions to those problems, it's like as if there's the solution and I'm running around going crazy and it's been sitting here the entire time. The big solutions to your problems are sitting right under your nose. But whatever level or paradigm that you're at is gonna determine your discernment, your perception, or what is able to get inside of you. So I would have, I mean, I can't even tell you how many solutions to my challenges there were right in front of me. And I know that you know this because many of you have worked hard on your social skills, dating, networking, making friends, getting a promotion, all that. And you'll have a friend who's maybe struggling in dating and you might show them maybe one of my older videos. And what do you notice when you do that? They can't let it land. And they keep chasing and chasing and chasing and chasing. And it goes back to that kind of hiding from God thought experiment. You'd be taking away their addiction to hiding from their own greatness and their own potential. And so when you're at a point that you're so addicted that, that you're, it's, you're hiding from your potential, it's like sometimes the solution is so easy and so beautiful and so awesome. It's standing right in front of you, but it's just too awesome. And you're wearing those sunglasses you can't let it in. So for, as a basic example would be this. Let's say that you, uh, this example I've used a lot today. Say that you walk through a park. 
Do you notice how you just can't let in the beauty of the park? When is the last time that you walked through Central Park and really just paused and just really let in how awesome it is? It is so hard to really do that. And what you'll often find is people who grind it out and hustle it out and grind it out and hustle it out, they finally achieve the life that they thought would make them happy and they go super duper nuts. Eckhart Tolle says this. He says there's two things that make you unhappy. Getting what you want and not, not, not getting what you want. But wait, I messed up the surprise there. We already know that. I messed up the surprise. No! Ah! So, okay. Not getting what you want and getting what you want. So I had that same experience. I made videos about it. You might have seen a video I made called um, When You Stop Competing, You Win. I made that in Hawaii in front of my old apartment. Some of you might remember that. It was, it was in my, in, in uh, maybe around 2006, and I've been grinding and hustling for many years. That's back when, for me, four years felt like a long time. Now four years goes by like a breeze. Be aware of that as you get older. But at the time, I'd been grinding it out for four years, a long time for me at the time. And I finally had everything I wanted. I lived oceanfront in Hawaii, eating five-star dinners almost every night, going bodyboarding, making love on the balcony while fireworks go off, while a dolphin swims by your house and winks at you. I mean, I had it all. And or what I perceived as having it all. And I felt the exact same. I was like, why do I feel like this? I feel the exact same. Because I wasn't at a paradigm where I could even absorb that. And you'll see this, you'll see, it's funny. It's really funny about Hawaii. There's something about Hawaii where people go nuts. It's kind of a funny thing. You know, I had a, I had a, a new client who I just signed up actually. I'm doing some one-on-one -on -one with him. He's a wealthy, successful guy. And he had the exact same experience in Hawaii. He's like, I was sitting in Kauai. I'm like, I knew it. It's like, it's always Hawaii, right? Cause it's like in Hawaii, it's like, it is like a paradise on earth. So you're finally sitting in Kauai. You're like, I'm in paradise. You're like, I feel the same. I thought this was gonna work. And it makes you go nuts. So I, I was clowning with him, we were joking, we were having some of our first phone calls, and I said, he was telling me he had a similar experience when he was in Kauai, which is one of the Hawaiian Islands, actually the most beautiful in my uh, opinion. They're all beautiful though. And um, this is very subjective, but in my opinion, Ka Kauai is the best, most beautiful. They're all beautiful, and for different reasons. But um, he went crazy, I said, I said, hey, load up this video, if you stop competing, you win. And it's me explaining that, right? So he's like, you too? It's a common thing in Hawaii. And I saw this one time, I went to the Nepali coast, uh, of Kauai, which is probably the most beautiful place in the entire world. Again, very subjective. But you can look, if you look up Nepali Coast later tonight on your phone, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I remember I went there with my friends and, I, and it was like, I just, it was so beautiful. I mean, it is so ridiculous. It, it, it is obnoxious, like green rolling cliffs carved by rain in this, you know, in like mystical rainforest with rainbows and dolphins, like, like, the, like the 10X version of normal Hawaii. It's like totally insane. I um, mean, you know, it's where they would have shot King Kong or Jurassic Park, but like the best parts, so just completely ridiculous. And I remember being in Kauai and I started chronically talking about business with my friends. We're camping in the Nepali coast. You hike in 11 miles and you're away from your phone. And I was like, in business you do this, in business you do that. And then you gotta do this. And then I'm gonna go do that. And then eventually you're gonna do this. And then eventually you're gonna do that. And I kept looping on this. My buddies who I was with, they started trolling up and down the beach to look for people to chat up. And I'm thinking like, yo, this ain't no Hollywood club, bro. Like, there's nothing here. Like, whatever you're gonna find here, you don't want it. And they kept going up and down doing it. They're like, yeah, maybe we'll find someone. Yeah, we're gonna hit someone up. Yeah, 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 <laughs> like doing that. Notice they're going back in their autopilots. I'm going back in my autopilot because I can't let the glory land. It's too awesome, it's too beautiful. And what had happened to me one year was I, it was so beautiful that I got so angry that I hiked off the trail, leaving my friends back at the campground, and I ran off the trail in this like wicked rage, like, I'm going back to get work done, ah! And like just hiked off the trail, like full tilt, almost like killing myself on the side of cliffs because it was too beautiful. Now again, you're hearing this, you're like, what is with this dude? Like, just go to Hawaii, bro. Like, what the hell's wrong? You know, what's wrong? But what it is is that, you get something so awesome, it's so incredible that you can't look at it directly. And so you put back on the sunglasses. I see this when I'm dating people. And you know, I live in a, in a beautiful home in the Hollywood Hills. I've got, a, I've got a private gym, a private trainer, a full staff. I've, and I mean, my life, I've got a really beautiful life. Like, because I do social media, you're, you guys are gonna laugh. It's to the point where I could be in the middle of nowhere and if I need help with anything, I just start talking really loud and make a scene. And inevitably, nine times out of 10, someone will run up to me like, I love you. And I'm like, can you drive me somewhere? They're like, yes. And they'll drive me around. They'll get me into clubs. You guys saw it last night when we were out, right? There was people right in front of clubs, like try to get me in. They were inviting us to parties. Every, if I want to get in high-end clubs in, in LA or New York, wherever, I just go to the front. I just talk very loud and be like, oh my God, right? They bring me on their table. So like, 
It's just epic. Like everywhere I go, I can make friends. And the best thing about Nishibe's fame, it's not like Mike Tyson where everybody knows him, but they might have not watched his best fights. They don't know who Kustamato is. They don't know his story. They just want a picture with him to show their friends. They don't even follow him. People who know me follow my stuff. So they've watched the videos. They love it. They're really appreciative. It's an incredible level having like mid, low level, niche level fame. It's a beautiful thing, right? Um, people introduce me to, you know, to, to all sorts of very attractive people. They bring me to tables. They bring me to parties. Like it's really beautiful. And so I literally live in a reality in like beautiful mansion in the hills. And again, I'm not attached to this. I might not have it forever. My story might end badly or embarrassingly, but I'm just saying it's something I have right now. And you know, I go shopping on Rodeo. I eat in five star dinners. I go traveling to islands and all stuff. And a lot of time I'll be dating somebody and their whole life they thought they want to meet somebody like that. They thought that. And what happens is you'll see them starting getting mad. They do in that situation what I did in the Nepali coast. They start finding problems, finding things wrong with it, and you see who the next person who they date is, and if, inevitably it's some person who like takes them for granted, dumps them, leaves them, like you know does nasty things to them. It's like really, really funny. And usually they call back and they're like, oh, Ed, I'm sorry, but they needed to go through that to even know what they had. And I observed that again and again to the point that sometimes now if I'm dating someone, I'll just like kind of like make some little random thing that's harmless, like innocuous to be mad about, just let them get that out on that. You know what I mean? Like I'll just sort of, just like make, just to make some snide remarks like what, Meh, like that. And I'll just like let them run that pattern on that because I know the situation is too awesome. Now when you hear this, it sounds crazy, but a simple way of putting it, and again, not stereotyping, I'm not saying this to everybody, but imagine if you met somebody who's struggling with drugs and homelessness and you brought them into that environment. Maybe they're hooked on meth. Do you think that just because you bring them up to a mansion, they instantly stop smoking meth in the bathroom? You think they're not gonna go like ruffling through your sock drawer and taking your socks? You think they're not gonna start getting mad about random things? That's a real thing. I've had staff that are maybe new level, like the lowest level staff in my team, and I'll invite them to stay at my house. And I find that usually what happens, and these are really great um, team members, they'll start bickering with other people that are there. And I'm like, brother, look at this view. You've got to view the city, you've got a private gym, you've got a home movie theater, you've got a home spa, you've got great friends here, and you know I'm gonna kick you out if you're just gonna start bickering, because why do I wanna deal with this? Is it worth it? But they can't stop. And I'll say, cool, just go do your thing on me. And then, because they're just saying as a guest, and usually about a year later, they're like, can I just come crash you for like a couple weeks again? I'm like, all right, we're gonna be good this time. And then now, after the pain of it, when they have the regret, then they get it. The real key to life, though, is not having to go through that regret. And when something beautiful lands, allow it to land. And I've made that same mistake where I didn't let it land. And people who I've worked with have made that same mistake. I've had, I've, I've had it where so, you know, I'll meet some random person like on the street, make friends with them, build them into a low level celebrity. We'll go to a half a million dollar launch. Maybe it took two, three months to put it together. Maybe it made 500K. And they start yelling and crying that they thought they could have made 510 if there was a tweak on an email. And that's real. And they go nuts. It's like the demon took over. Like they go psycho. Mm -hmm. And I think there, there, there is a point where you want to debrief and actually like acknowledge that where you could have done better. But in that case, they just resonate with like an impoverished mental state. It's an impoverished reality that they're living in. It's just too awesome. You just got a, a half a million dollars just sharing your ideas while people thank you. I'm taking my own personal funds, piling it in the company so that you can have a brand. I'm not even telling you. You probably, you probably wouldn't do that yourself, so you don't realize that I would. And literally, it's beautiful. But it's, they're flipping out over $10,000. It's like there's this beautiful parade that so much went involved in that to build it, but all the person can talk about is the smudge on the window. There's a fingerprint on the window. Like, that feedback about the email, that was real. You probably could have got another 10K if we'd done a, the email better, but you gotta have a million bucks! You know, it's like, shut up! Because, I'm not just gonna keep getting abused forever. So, you know, at a certain point, I'm gonna be like, dude, just, you, like, like, and they melt down. But you know what the meltdown looked like? As much as I could be mad, I did the same thing. In fact, what I did is just as bad. I'm sitting there in Nepali Coast with great friends, and all I can do is complain. I have another story I often tell at seminars. I was sitting in, it, it, was, it was when the recession first hit. That was another really big bump that we had in our business when the recession in 2009. And I'm sitting out there in Phoenix and I, and I got this idea to create this real life interaction based program that I put out, it was really successful for us. And I was getting the footage and, and we were in the middle of the recession, it was very tough. And I had an unplanned pregnancy with the mom of my kid. And what happened was I found out that because she didn't have maternity insurance, that's called a pre-existing condition. I was gonna have to come up with 50 grand. And I was already 500 grand in debt. 
because the recession is. This is what happens when you're self-funded. You're not venture capital funded, right? You've got to fund yourself, and it's just insanity. So what ha it can be. So especially when you're learning on the fly, and I just wasn't there. But again, all the problems were always in front of me, but I couldn't see them at the time because the paradigm I was in. I'll talk more on that. So I remember I'm sitting there, and I thought that I'd got the footage that I needed, but the mic had gone out, and I see all this beautiful footage that I would have used, and the mic went out, and I spent the whole day in a raging pain body attack. Like what Eckhart Tolle would call a pain body attack, just miserable all day. And I remember sitting there thinking like, I've got a new son coming. Yeah, I'm in some debt, but money's money. You can get your way out of it. My friends are here. They're all here to support me through this tough time, here to help me get this footage. I've got a great skill set. I've got potential. I could beat this, but I couldn't stop being mad. And you know what happened? My buddy Eric Shen, he took a right turn, and a car slammed, a truck slammed right into me. And I was bleeding and I was unconscious. And I woke up out of that unconsciousness, bleeding, covered in glass, thinking I was gonna die. And I realized I got tricked. I could feel it, my last day on earth, and I wasted it being mad. And I was so disappointed in myself for that. But I, and I realized that nothing really mattered in life other than who you loved and the legacy that you left of love. And that's all that will matter and you will dissolve. And that's what is actually important. I realized that. And I started, I, I was like twitching, bleeding. I was texting my friends like, I love you, just like twitching. Because all I wanted my friends to know is that I love them before I died. That's all that I cared about. Some of them were like, love you too, bro. Like, they're, like, they're like, what's going on? Right? And, and I did that. Now I was in bed for a couple months after. And you want to know the stupid part of the whole thing? Afterwards, I got out on a limp. I went to Orange County. And I recorded the exact same type of footage that I got in Phoenix in two minutes. You know, two minutes it started. It was like an hour clip. And I realized how stupid it was that I got myself that mad. And in many ways, I, I almost felt like I made myself so angry. It, it almost felt as if, probably not, but it felt as if I'd almost used the law of attraction that I got that negative that a car just came and hit me. It almost felt that way. And maybe it was, I don't know, maybe it's narcissistic, but it felt that way and that's how I experienced it. And that's what I'm saying to you is that the solution is always in front of you. It's so easy. Like, is it really that hard for me to go get that? It's like, I made it hard. Oh, I'm broke. I'm gonna go to Phoenix. I have to get it. I have outcome. I need it so bad. But really, the solution was right there. And so by me getting crashed into, I, I just sort of snapped out of it. I was like, I can do this. I can 100% do this. Just go out tonight on a limp, on a limp. I went out and got this great clip, real life interaction, open a close and everything great. Showed that, and I showed that, I showed that for years. And then you wanna know what I actually did with that other clip that didn't have the uh, mic? This is what's so stupid about the whole thing. I, for, I just remember this now. I realized that I had two other clips that also lost sound that were really, really good clips. And then I would begin um, each time that I would teach that course saying, hey guys, I'm gonna show you a, uh, some interactions with the volume off so that you can look at the body language. And then I just showed the exact same clips the, about the body language, it made it even better. Ah! <laughs> It was so easy, you know, right? And, the, and, and then the other 99% of the program is all the volume. So you might, some of you might remember that. If anybody remembers that old program, I had those silent ones to start. It's because the freaking mic went out. I'm like, I'm just gonna show you this with the, you know, <laughs> the volume. But it was just, they were great clips and I love them. And I just showed it with the volume off to folks on um, body language. You might've heard the story that I told. I remember one time, one of my mentors, Evan Pegan, he had a program called On Being a Man. I've told the story before. And he, same idea. And it was this whole program on the idea of growing from a boy into a man and how a boy is always shirking responsibility, like he blames failure on everybody else, but he takes all the credit and a man blames uh, the failures on himself and gives others the credit. And it was this whole program about that and what it means to be a grown adult and what real grown masculinity looks like. You know, kind of thing that talking about these days, people might get a little in a, in a tiff, right? But it's a beautiful, beautiful program on, on a, what it means to be an adult male. And, I, I read the PDF, somebody put this PDF file, it was a PDF summary of a DVD series from like 20 years ago or so, or 15, 20 years ago, on my desktop, on my laptop. And one day I was like, what is this stupid PDF? Who put this here, one of my staff? And I read it and I was blown away, changed my life forever. And many of these ideas are, are integrated in, in, into my ideas now that I share, right? I learned that, a lot of that from Evan. He learned it from great sources like uh, Robert Bly, Iron John, Sam Keen, Fire in the Belly, uh, David Data, The Way of the Superior Man, all these great sources. And so I, I call up Eben and I say to Eben, that program is just incredible. It's amazing. That PDF was amazing. And it was him who ran it. And he said, oh, and I'm gonna send you the DVDs. I was actually moving out of my house that day. I said, Eben, I'm moving out of my house. So I'm not gonna get them on time. Don't worry, the PDF was amazing, I'm chill. He says, I'm gonna overnight them. I'm like, all right, okay, thank you, amazing, thank you. Sends them over. I watched them that day on a bus to Quebec City. And in the third DVD, I think it was, Eben, looks in the crowd, he says, if you like these, these kind of bigger picture ideas, 
the guy who's really good at teaching the real life version and taking you out is actually Owen. He's sitting in the front row. And again, ah, 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 like this amazing program. And I was there. I was in the program. And I didn't see it. Okay? And that's where, even right now, you don't know what you're not seeing. You don't know what you're focusing on and not seeing. You don't know what's going over your head because you can only resonate with a paradigm that you're at now. You might have seen old programs like The Blueprint, and maybe you look at them five years later and you're like, I feel like I've never seen this. And you're seeing it at a different paradigm. All those problems that I had, in truth, there were experts who could have just said to me, Owen, here's the answer. And by the way, I hate to say it, they did. But I just wasn't done suffering. So at a certain point, you gotta say, I'm done. Say it with me, I'm done. done. You're really not, but. <laughs> Okay, say it again. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done suffering. I'm done suffering. I want to wake up. Life can be easy. Can be I, can easy. I can accomplish a lot. So that's the idea. That there's that, and this is sort of a funny thing too. Have you guys ever maybe been online and see these like crazy videos made about me, and you're like, how does no one even deal with that? You ever wonder that? You ever seen this? Okay, if you look me up online, there's craziest videos. I'll tell you how I deal with it. Somebody who would be at a program like this would never watch that. Did you see how most of you didn't even know what that was? You see that? There is so much crazy stuff. So maybe some of you know, but there is so much crazy stuff. I have never seen my shopping cart show a lower number when somebody makes a nasty video about me or a nasty media article. It's never, ever happened. And the reason why is because somebody who would resonate with a bunch of crap talking and negativity is not a buyer. They're not somebody who'd be in this room. So it never impacts a single penny at all. Notice. It just, you guys are like, video, what? We're talking about all this cool stuff. Why do you care about that, Owen? You made a video about it. What's that? I only know the one that you made a video about with him. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had 10 million views recently in the past month or two because I was giving him some coaching and then these huge YouTubers came on and like, that's bad what you did to him and all that kind of stuff. It's so crazy, right? So I'll do some work with him tomorrow and we'll show what's, what's coming that. The thing is, I, for the first time in my life, it popped on my YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Taking a shit bit, talking shit about mm -hmm. it. It's the first time I've ever seen mm -hmm. it every year. So. And I bet you when you okay. see it, and these have been around my whole career, but I bet you when you see it, you're like, okay, I guess, and then you move on. Because I mean. buyers, yeah. that's the thing. What happens is when people make crap talking videos, what kind of list are they building? Crap They're building crap talkers, non buyers, non spenders. What would happen if one of my billionaire clients or multi millionaire clients clicked on a video of me just like, you know what I say about this? That's not the truth. And I am the light, I am the best, right? If they see that, they're like, this guy's crazy, right? So what I've learned is my shopping cart never goes down because what I, because I realized that we were gonna get, just get crapped on forever and ever. And I realized the solution is not to react and react and react and react, but just to make very, very, very high level content. Content that is so high level that people at a low level can't even see it. They're just like, this is dumb. <laughs> right? Like, like, it's like if you went to a homeless person and you're like, look, you could have a job that pays you 25 bucks an hour. They're just like smoking the rock. They're like, that's dumb. <laughs> and they just go back to smoking, right? Again, it's that hiding from your greatness thing. What is one of the best ways to hide from your greatness? Taking drugs, drinking, talking crap, gossiping, breaking your own integrity. These are all ways to hide from your greatness. And your brain trick you. Yes, and so by the way, I sometimes have um, clients that are very successful and they may have a media crisis and I say, listen, if your buyers are buying a great product from you, they're not gonna be focused on that because they can't resonate with it. It's almost like looking at, at like, you know, a snuff film of people like murdering each other. You're just like, oh, you can't see it. But, but that's something too low and that's why my business continues to succeed in spite of all that crap that gets put up. And they're always like, how come we just talk all this crap and it never works, right? It's because it's that too low of a paradigm and they're cultivating a negative list. If you wanna cultivate a great list, Look, here's some secrets to it, okay? One of my buddies, he'll build his list by saying, you know what, for anybody who went to college, you learned a lot, but in college, they didn't teach you one great skill, negotiation. So anybody who went to college, have a look at this. Why does he say that thing about college? Because anybody who spent $100,000 or $20,000 in college is a qualified buyer, right? There's a guy named Garrett J. White. He only will mentor, he's ama completely amazing, next level, like, a, like a, a living legend, this guy. And he will only mentor entrepreneurs that are married. Why do you think he chooses to only, he says, if you've gotta be an entrepreneur who's, who's married. Why do you think he chooses that niche? Because they have money, right? You're picking people with money. Okay, I like to work with everybody, just being real. I love working with anyone who's positive. So for me, I'll work with, with people at the top, as far as income, people at the bottom, everywhere in between. I'll do free stuff, cheap stuff, expensive stuff, everything. But the bottom line is this. 
That's called screening for leads. If you're putting just negativity out there, what kind of list are you building? You're building a list where you'll be broke. Then you'll be mad. Then you'll see maybe people like myself or others that have big crowds, living life, having fun. It'll make you even more mad. You'll talk even more crap. You'll attract even more negative lead weight customers. They'll all be mad. You'll bond off of that. And you know how they get energy? They get, they get energized by poop eating. They eat physical poop. I want you to start observing what energizes the people around you. What energizes you? Do you get energized with gossip, energized with hatred, energized with enemy centeredness, energized with looking down on other people to make yourself feel better about yourself? What energizes you? Ask yourself that. At a high level, here's the key to everything. Here's the key to this whole thing that we've talked about today. What it ultimately is, is it's opening the lens, opening the lens to where even, and this is gonna sound nuts, but go with me, go, just go here with me for a minute and consider it. It's when you open the lens that you could stare at a freaking flower and if you wanted to, you could allow that to bring you to tears because you recognize this is a brief moment in my life. It's so brief, it's so beautiful. This is one of God's creations. If you're not into that, call it the earth's creation, whatever it is, but whatever that is, is so rare and so beautiful. And what starts to happen is that energy goes inside of you and energizes you. And now, maybe you don't need caffeine. You don't need to be a hater, because that's what they do. They get dopamine, right? Haters, they get dopamine by, if you crap talk somebody else, you get dopamine because you feel relative success. Why, why become Michael Jordan and go through all the pain of that when you can crap talk Michael Jordan and feel above? Oh, Jordan, he sucks. And you can do that and feel better and get more dopamine than him, but it's built on a lie. And you don't have the results to back it up and your life sucks and you're stuck in hell, right? The world, this idea of heaven or hell, perhaps it may exist beyond this earth, but what if it existed while we're here yeah. today? And that, this is how what I'm showing you is how we create our own heavens or hell and how we are only able to perceive that which our lens is able to open up. So even through all of these challenges that I talked about here today, when I would have the solution right in front of me, I couldn't see it. Friends of mine would come to me and say, hey, Owen, why don't you go skiing, man? I can't go skiing. Owen, go skiing. I can't, I gotta get my backlog done. Bro, go skiing. And then you go skiing, and you have that next brilliant idea, and you get in a flow, and you get more energy, and you realize that just by skiing, it just made your business another half a million bucks, you know, if you're further along in your thing, right? And obviously, that can go too far the other direction. You just ski all day, and that's derping. But the point is, is that in, in releasing and letting go, see, in contract, in control, trying to control everything, in execution, right? See, it's almost like a derper, it's like there's nothing. There's nothing being perceived. It's just numbness, autopop, path least resistance. An executor tightens their filter. And so what you'll see in the pupil of an executor is their eyes are like a shark oftentimes, right? They're like, they're, it's very shark-like. But then what you'll see in someone who's released is their, is their pupils open up and they're being energized by everything. Because human beings, we have two major ish challenges that we deal with. One is that we don't know who we are and the other is we're, we're lacking that emotional fulfillment that would give us kind of a, a, like a stable foundation from which to act. You ever had it when you're out at a club and you're in state and you feel so good that you, you have a stable foundation from which to act? Why do a lot of people drink alcohol? It kind of numbs, you know how the mind is like self-doubt and negative self-talk and negativity and it's sort of scattered? Maybe you have a couple beers, it kind of quiets those voices and allows you that center point to feel like you know who you are, to feel like you're just chill. But when you can develop that on your own, that's the best. And the problem is, what do people that are just hardcore executors need in order to feel good? Usually alcohol or drugs, right? He's, had a, he's worked with a lot of millionaires. A lot of them do cocaine. They, they get prostitutes. They get drunk. And they need that, right? Or people might need to crap talk others or feel falsely superior to others and things like that to feel like they know who they are and to feel emotionally fulfilled. But when you can open that lens up wide and let the world come into you. And you've got to, so what you've got to do is release. Let go. Let go. Let go. Now, as a derper, you've got to tighten up. But let go. Let go, let go, and allow yourself to become present to the moment. Allow that to be your grounded point, and suddenly life can become easy. You connect to the flow. You connect to your power, your higher power, and then you can act from there. And that is what it means. What we've discussed today is how to go from derper <laughs> to executor to transcendent, to find that endless motivation, because at the highest level motivation, you don't even need it. Okay? At the highest level motivation, you're tapped in and you go with the flow. 
and you're working even less hard than a derper, but accomplishing a thousand times more. So that is what I'm drawing your attention here today through a variety of exercises and speeches and trying to push you and trying to motivate you. And we're going to be doing a lot of exercises on this here together. So tomorrow, the next couple of days, it's going to be a lot of beautiful exercises that we're going to be hammering here together. I want to inspire you. I want everybody to go home tonight. Go have a great night. Go get some rest. Let some of this stuff land. Let it marinate. You're getting given the keys right here that have taken me decades to figure out. It's been put right to you. Let it land. Let it land. Let it land. I love you all very much. Go home, relax, marinate, be here on time at 3 p.m. tomorrow, and I'll see you soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you guys. It's awesome.